Um, so now we will go to the first presentation. So the first presentation will be from uh, Dr. Petronila Nduzu. I have seen her in the meeting room. Uh, so Dr. Petronila Nduzu is from the State Department of Livestock. Um, and she will talk about what they're, they're doing um, in her presentation. Welcome, Dr. Petronila. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, I know I have a very busy schedule, so I'm only going to take a very short time by going through the presentation that will be presented during the international conference next week. So my, presentations, my presentation is on supporting national and county policies, commitments, targets, plans for advancing rich land restoration. For those I'm meeting today, my name is Dr. Petronila Wanjogo Dudu. I'm from the State Department of Livestock, anchored under Rage Resource Development uh, Division. The outline of my presentation will be background, challenges, approaches adopted to address the issues, lessons learned, and the way forward. So the background of my presentation is that Kenya has two levels of government, and most of us know that. So we have the counties, we have the national government, and both the levels of government are committed to development, developing policies. So as such, the need to support the various level of government is key so that uh, different policies can be developed. And for our case here, we are looking at those policies that support the restoration of the range runs. So we also find that the non-state actors are also involved in the restoration and the non-state actors that we are looking at here are the community service organizations. We also have NGOs. We have also other people that is the development partners, the research organization. All those support in the development of the policies. Sorry, at that point, we are saying that also the national government and the county are also part of developing these counties and uh, of the policies. And in most cases, they contribute to the county integrated development plans. So we have challenges that we face during this time of the developing uh, the policies, the plans and the strategies. And one of the challenges that we face is low technical capacity and awareness on restoration among county directors, officials, and administrators. So in this case, we are looking at the awareness of low cost restoration approaches suitable for rage lands due to the misconception that restoration is in tree planting that results in the lack of political goodwill for restoration. There's also another challenge that is lack of counties, partial and radius plans with clear regulations and also lack of enforcement of spatial plans in place. There's also a challenge of limited funding at both county and national level. So in this one, we are looking at the dissemination, dissemination of the national level policies and strategies at county level. And other issue that we look at at this point is the printing of so many copies. You know that the country is fast with 47 counties, which also have sub counties. So in this case, you need so many copies that need to reach everybody. There's also implementing the ledger restoration initiatives, e.g. the lack of proper financing mechanisms especially for trust lands that are held in the trust for the commitment by the county government and the communal lands. Our next challenge is lack of adoption of rage management, restoration policy, management, restoration policies, plans and strategies due to lack of sensitization linked to the lack of extension surfaces. We know at this point, uh, the number of extension officers that we have has reduced because the government for a, within a long time has not been employing. So we find that the number of staff that are on the 
We are also looking at how actors are supporting national and county policies commitments, targets plans for advancing our regular restoration. So in this case, we have different organizations that are doing this. And one of the organization is the State Department of Livestock. And on this case, the State Department of Livestock is mandated to develop regular management policy regulation strategies uh, this, and brands. At the same time, they develop capacity and research uh, manuals, and then there's pastoralism and value chain development. The SDL also develop brands which are used to rehabilitate ragelands and also develop and conserve ragelands genetics and feed resources. Another organization that is also doing policies and um, brands for restoration is Nature Kenya. And what they are doing is promoting policy formulation processes at national and county levels and supports county policy processes to integrate restoration. A county that is doing that is Tana River, County Forest and Radiscape Restoration. Nature Kenya is also supporting counties to integrate restoration targets into CIDPs. They are also supporting local policy implementation processes by building the capacity of local community institutions in sustainable land management and restoration. The other organization that is also helping in um, developing or supporting of the national and the county policy is, policies is International Livestock Research Institute. And what they are doing is supporting the development of county Regulations management bills designed to be compatible with the Community Land Act. And this is being done in Wajil, Istioro, Masabit, and Garissa counties. We also have the Ministry of Water, which is also helping in developing of the policies for regional restoration. And what they have done is that we have developed a land reclamation policy that cuts across all ecosystems and landscapes, including regions. Another organization that is also helping in developing of the restoration of Regiland's policy is Northern Regiland Trust. And what they have done is they have worked with the Saburu and the Sioro County government to develop county range management policies. We also have Great Face Zebra Trust. And what they have done is that they have worked with the NLT to support the development of range management policies. Another organization is Center for Agriculture and Bioscience International. What they have done in supporting the county and national policies is that they have supported the development of the national pro Prosopi strategy for Kenya aimed at the sustainable, sustainable management of the propolis Prosopis Juliflora. There's also an, another organization that has been part of supporting these county and national policies, plans, and strategies. And uh, this is Enonixu Conservation. And what they have done is that they have collected data for rangeland management by developing whereby they have developed grazing plans for scientists. And they're also doing something on carbon credits policies and they have been involved in decision-making. We have some lessons that we have learned from that. And that is we have a variety of approaches that can be used to support the integration of regular restoration into counties and national level policies, plans, stroke targets. So one of them is supporting the development of the national regional management and restoration policies and strategies and many others. It's also supporting the development of county range management plans, county spatial plans, land use plans. It's also supporting counties to mainstream restoration targets into county integrated development plans. Another lesson learned is supporting 
local community institutions set up to strengthen to enhance sustainable road management, e.g. community forest associations, water resource users associations, beach management units, village natural resources, and land use committees. And lastly, implementing large scale bridge land restoration projects such as Twende, in, which involves multiple stakeholders, including county and national level government for better coordination for the learning. There is also creating awareness of the need for ragland restoration and capacity building on restoration approaches suitable for ragelands at county level, which is also vital for creativity and goodwill in the counties and nationals. And lastly, the funding is required to support the dissemination of national level rage management or station policies, stroke plans, stroke strategies, and support their development at county level. That is the end of my presentation. At that point, you can see different stakeholders. They're trying to discuss and trying to see what they can do in the restoration. So that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Petronila. Um, we are grateful for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, so now we will have a presentation from Amina Malim. Um, Amina Malim is a research scientist with Kefri, based in Garissa, and uh, she will have a presentation on the role of youth um, and women in uh, restoration. Amina, you're welcome. Thank you, Kawira. So as you've been told, my name is Amina Malim. I'm a research scientist from uh, Kenya Forestry uh, Research Institute, Kefri, and I'm based in Garissa, and I'll be taking you through the the section covering exploring the role of youth, uh, of the youth and women, and how do we strengthen their involvement and capacity in restoration. And as for the outline of my presentation, I'll first do a background on the issue, and then start a bit on the challenges that we faced, that uh, they have faced during restoration, and what approaches they have used, the lessons they learned, and the way forward opportunities and the key messages. So these are the speakers who have contributed. Uh, you know, we've been having series of meetings in this uh, action group and uh, these presenters have all been, uh, these, they have made presentations in uh, the action group and in the various groups that they are working in and uh, in the various, you know, uh, under the various uh, restoration innovations uh, within their groups. And these are the, a brilliant team that I've been working with, Rene from uh, Ilri, Litoro Edrian from uh, Napo, Nature and People as one, and Is Isa Mohammed, uh, who is the founder, founder and CEO of Isiolo Conservationist Trust, and uh, Mana Omar from Springs of the Assels, of the Assels. So thank you, team. So on the background, we have seen that, um, we have seen that the youth and the women are critical actors in the, in, restoring the dry land and uh, their involvement in these restoration activities uh, could help accelerate or speed up success of the restoration uh, processes or activities that are going on. But the first question is, when we say young people, whom do we mean first? And in our group, we've seen that the young people were mostly between 18 to 18 years to 40 years. And as for the women, we've seen that they were 18 and above. But the challenging part of engaging young women is they have faced uh, challenges, challenges in meeting their daily basic needs and um, having to make decisions and uh, what do you call working in groups that are, have uh, many men engaged in, uh, involved in uh, the activities have been a bit of a challenge. And also the early marriages and the pregnancies kind of hinder the, the engagement. And uh, they mostly applied uh, the various groups we've seen have mostly been applying community-based approaches, which were climate, uh, were using climate smart uh, approaches. Of all the groups, they have had different aims uh, for their restoration initiatives. And uh, amongst them, those are looking at how, because mostly they were using fruit trees, fodder trees, and uh, some indigenous uh, species, and uh, some food crops. So they've been looking at how do we do they ensure food security and nutrition to the households that are they're undertaking their restoration activity 
and how do they uh, promote climate smart activities to enhance the community's resilience. And then in these arid lands, in these uh, dry lands, they are having uh, the invasive, the alien invasive species of uh, Prosopis juliflora. So in doing the restoration, they were doing reducing the land that was under the uh, that invasive species because it's the involvement of these young people. They were advocating to sustainably use uh, the natural resources and also get uh, what you call the goods and services from the trees planted. And um, amongst it being the shed from this uh, very serious sun that we are experiencing. Recently, we had 33 degrees here in Garissa. Have, have more trees, reduce the, the sun, the impact of the sun. And then um, they're also enhancing biodiversity conservation while they were integrating these uh, uh, income generating activities of having beekeep, uh, uh, beekeeping and then selling of haze and then having more birds uh, come and uh, create a habitat for themselves there. And since they were using mostly um, the, what do you call a neem tree the, as a director indica, they, because of its fast growing and uh, ability to adapt to the poor growing uh, soil conditions and its multipurpose use, it was also a very good uh, uh, natural fertilizer that was improving the soil fertility. And um, the aim of most of these youth-led restoration NGOs have been accelerating the engagement and uh, involvement of youth and uh, leadership of young people and women in restoration work within the various regions they came from. So the challenges, there were many challenges that were, that were listed uh, that was of, uh, were, that were experienced during the restoration uh, activities, and mainly was the lack of financial resources and equipments for restoration. The more the more in, uh, the land there was, the more they wanted more resources to uh, undertake their restoration activities. And also, most of the farm uh, most of the farmers would the community members would be enticed to come and join the others, but they were curbed by. Uh, the limitation of the tools to be used for that. And then the climate change issue of uh, having these unpredictable rains and then prolonged drought, which could uh, affect the, 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 process, the success of uh, the restoration work or even the growth of the, the structures being planted there. And then there was the lack of hub for nurturing. Youth are, the, youth are, the young people and the women are very innovative, but they were lacking the hub to nurture those innovative restoration solutions uh, or technologies that they had. And um, despite having this uh, knowledge of uh, the young people having this modern knowledge, there was also the issue of uh, dryland te uh, restoration technologies being missing, missing out in the youth and specifically on the issue of um, the indigenous knowledge of, uh, of, the, of the, the dryland restoration. And also the culture and the mindset change. Most of the communities who are in the drylands are pastoralists. Most of them are, and they are used to the idea of using what's available in the in the range, and not planting them because they don't have the patience uh, to wait for the for the time it takes for the for the trees or the plants to mature. So, and even having uh, youth to be taking place in uh, in the what do you call in the restoration activity itself would be like people want these white collar jobs are not interested in restoration. So changing that mindset itself would uh, was a, a bit of a challenge. So, and most of the young people have their own, their own things to be busy with. Even if the restoration, uh, there was a success in a restoration project, they've gotten the funding, uh, engaging the young people was a bit of a problem because sometimes they, as much as they've been uh, accommodated to come and take part in some of the activities, they would leave the, the seedlings or the, the planted trees and uh, it would go into waste. So they were a bit of uh, unreliable in terms of labor. So the invasion of Prosopis juliflora, which was out competing, whichever uh, structure that was planted was also another menace in the, in the restoration. And um, we have also this competing land use system, which the pastoralists have like a lot of uh, livestock and uh, they were damaging. And in this, during this the extremely extreme drought periods, they would get into the farms or the areas under uh, restoration, and they would damage the young plants or the seedlings within in the nursery. And then the issue of the power relation was there. In the, in the African setting, we have the issue of women not able to earn 
uh, to own land. They can use the land for a specific uh, uh, time and or whatever, but they don't have that ownership right. There, there was also the lack of support from local leadership, and um, which has been showcased in some cases that uh, favoring uh, what do you call uh, favoring some close relatives over those who are the activists who are undertaking uh, restoration uh, activities. And the lack of international representation because in COP right now, the one happening in, uh, in Egypt, there are a lot of young people who are coming from, uh, all, uh, all stakeholders are, are, are being uh, allowed to come and join, but uh, the young people from, uh, from Kenya have, have indicated that they, are, they don't have representation in such uh, global uh, platforms. So addressing the key issue, since we've been managed, we have managed to get uh, to get these uh, young people who were involved in uh, in the community in restoration of the uh, of the degraded sites in the range in the community. They have been able to use the community uh, based approach, and they have been doing it through uh, two ways. They have been engaging the community itself directly in land restoration activity, and they have been using traditional indigenous knowledge from the community to inform restoration uh, approaches, the species and the sites to use for, for restoration. And they have been engaging the community directly from the planning to the completion of their, of their work. And they have been mostly, and we also had a case from uh, Renee, who is a researcher from uh, Ilri, who has been working with uh, uh, through her data collection from, uh, from uh, women in Baringo who are using participatory range ma management uh, approach. So what lessons have we learned? We've learned that uh, youth-led organizations engaged in restoration work uh, are increasing and they are contributing to the 10% forest cover achievement and resilience, uh, climate resilience of the community and the landscapes they're working in. And also the, to enhance sustainability of the restoration work, they're establishing, not only are they just planting, they're also leaving uh, trees and fruit tree nurseries to be managed by the young people and the men so they can continue if they get more land in uh, more land available for planting. And then they also have social media presence and uh, more picnic conversations, which are making youth engagement in, uh, in restoration be uh, fun. They're also innovative, but are lacking platforms to share ideas. And in Garissa, we had uh, an initiative called Marifa Kona, which was supported by USAID, and um, which uh, well, were kind of advocating for young people to present their local idea, uh, solutions for the local problems that they're experiencing. And it was a very competitive process and the best right now um, amongst the best internationally is from Garissa whom I've, I've mentored and is now working in his, uh, in his innovation right now. And there was also another land accelerator program under the AFR 100, which has supported uh, for the last two years has supported 500 youth um, from Africa and has been giving 7,000 US dollars as a first step, um, as a first, uh, what do you call, as a financial in incentive to develop their proposal very well. And once they have exhausted, they've been uh, continuing to give 10,000 US dollars to finalize. And, uh, to, and those projects were all geared towards benefiting the community and creating more impacts towards SDG and restoration and climate issues. So the areas to be restored are vast, but have limitation in terms of the capacity, the funding and the human resource to restore. And they, there were very many great sto success stories that they have planted thousands of trees uh, in, uh, but the current drought and reliable uh, rainfall patterns are challenging these restoration processes. So there is need to engage uh, the private sector investment as well in enhance, uh, as well as enhancing financial access to the young women, uh, to the young men and women. But the question is, which, mod which medium should they use? Even if they come, what financial uh, uh, mechanism should be put in place uh, was, the, was the biggest question. Participatory range management, uh, as much as it's going on for the, for the community, uh, we need to also monitor land governance and restoration successes. So the way forward, we have a bit of uh, a mix up because we have opportunities we have uh, in terms of uh, uh, we have uh, what do you call, we need access to funding and uh, provision of more youth funding that are youth centric, youth in restoration centric funding, and then training and mentorship on sustainable range uh, restoration technologies. And then we need training on uh, enhancing training on the management of invasive management and control of invasive species, and also increasing community um, 
livelihood and socio-ecological benefits, and then contribution to local, regional, and global, uh, global restoration targets, targets whilst connecting and exchanging with other youth from uh, the rest of the world. And uh, partnership with organizations and programs such as C4, ECRAF, um, Regreening Africa to scale uh, to upscale uh, our projects in terms of outreach. Because I think even the Regreening Africa should set uh, what you call uh, regional uh, mapping where they, they need to consider uh, people from the Northern Kenya, people from the different, even the Northern Kenya itself, there are different uh, critical or sensitive ecosystems that need restoration and not just um, uh, generalizing uh, restoration as in the drylands and then picking a specific site and then leaving others to monitor. And then partnership with relevant organizations and then youth and women capacity on uh, dryland restoration technologies. And then we need to actively uh, engage the private sector and then as much as we are doing all that community household income to be boosted through income generating activities, um, including beekeeping and haystacking. So as the what actions do we need to do uh, uh, right now? We need to create more youth and women centric restoration programs that are, uh, have been driven by um, initiatives that would make the youth showcase the innovations that they have and make a basis for why they need funding. And then counties to engage the youth in their development discussions and resource, uh, allocate resources to implement them and, uh, and make it uh, what you call uh, prioritize them according to the county development, uh, the, CIDP, the, the CIDP, the County Integrated Development Plan. And then also engagement in local climate solution platforms, both locally and internationally. And um, also enhance representation and participation in COP and the restoration centric conferences. We should be having like the organizations or institutions that are uh, restoration, uh, focusing on restorations in the dryland to consider taking the successful, uh, the successful youth led organizations to be presenting their success stories, um, success stories to, the, to, the, to the rest of the world where they can be proud of their leadership and also their work. And then have multiple picnic uh, conversations. Young people open up about landscape restoration and they, make, they like making their conversation on nature uh, conservation being more fun. And then also creating awareness on successful youth-led restoration work for mindset and perception change of the community because we need to have these success stories for our people having more followers or more people uh, joining the restoration brigade. So as for support required, would require more funding and uh, for the restoration work, whether it's from the county, and we also need to collab closely collaborate with the county government and allocate certain percentage in their budget, and then partnership with the institutions, could be research institutions, programs funding restoration activities uh, to scale up restoration efforts for sustainability of projects where they can get uh, mentorship and uh, training, uh, what do you call training and help build their capacity on which best restoration approach to use for that uh, designated uh, ecosystem. And also management of this invasive species because it's outdoing the research work that we are do that the youth and the women are under undertaking at the moment. Uh, and then invitation and participation in dryland restoration uh, workshops, not only to showcase and learn, but also network uh, both locally and internationally and having more youth with traditional uh, knowledge to use for developing systems and tool to monitor restoration projects. Not only are we trying to bring science and appreciate science, we should also have indigenous knowledge helping us to say, uh, to appreciate what we are doing and monitoring the progress of the research um, of the restoration project. And then capacity building on uh, the invasive species management, like the Prosopis juliflora, and also uh, promotion of continuous use of social media platform to advocate for more youth uh, engagement. So the, the key messages uh, we've gotten from uh, the engagement, uh, the youth and women, the young women and men are actively engaged with restoration of uh, critical ecosystems. And in doing so, uh, they're demanding to be accommodated in platforms for more opportunities and, network, and networks. 
uh, despite having like unemployment and uh, in Kenya at the moment, and uh, we are having many people who have graduated, who have studied and graduated uh, higher, higher learning, um, higher education, but have no jobs. So uh, there is comp that competing interest of should, should they consider getting a white collar job or should they start venturing into this uh, restoration and showcasing those uh, successful ones? And then climate change, the scope of land uh, to restore and the invasion, uh, the invasive species, uh, species are slowing down the restoration uh, successes in the drylands. And uh, the restoration initiatives include uh, with, from the groups that we've already, who have done the presentation, the you know, initial restoration initiatives included planting thousands of trees in farms, in the rangelands, in schools, and establishing nurseries that are all contributing to the national commitment of uh, the 10% tree cover and also the sustainable development goals. And another brilliant point is young people have brilliant landscape restoration ideas, but require technical, financial, and networking support at county, national, and international levels, and uh, more funding to be able to help them in, in supporting rest their restoration work, and also um, capacity, Capacity is something that would really be a very good addition to them. Private sector investment, uh, something to consider that can help when other sec sectors are not able to, or there is competition or overcrowding in that other section, private sector could come in handy to the, in uh, the youth, in encouraging more youth to undertake restoration work. We also have this power dynamic still affecting, uh, still existing and, um, which affect the governance structure, especially on the land use uh, access and ownership for young women. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Amina, for the passion that you bring into this work, uh, the work that you're doing in Garissa, the support you've given to the action group, and we are looking forward to more support from you. Um, now we will go to Dr. Stephen Moravi's presentation. Dr. Stephen Moravi is a senior lecturer at the um, uh, Department of uh, Land Resource uh, Management um, at the University of Nairobi. And he will um, start the presentation. He'll, he'll tell a little bit more of himself and then he will do the presentation. Welcome, Dr. Moridi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline, and the, the, all the organizers at uh, this Greening uh, Africa uh, webinar on restoring Kenya regions, uh, the way forward. Uh, as Caroline have said, my name is uh, Stephen Moraithi. I'm a, a senior lecturer and a researcher at the University of Nairobi. I am a regic ecologist. I deal with range land restoration and also uh, soil. Uh, I'm a soil scientist. And I combine the two uh, disciplines to see uh, how we can restore our degree. And uh, I thank uh, you for inviting me to share in this webinar. I will share on how to achieve large scale, la uh, achieve large scale change at large scale level, uh, or how we can restore, we can achieve scale at uh, uh, on restoration at large scale level. And I must say that uh, when I uh, contemplated of this on this topic, uh, I will add a little spanner. I will not take the view of the most uh, of uh, projects that uh, uh, like a uh, project that we are implementing, but I want to a little bit hover in uh, uh, above and see things from sort of a bird's eye view. Yeah, uh, I will have this uh, outline. I'll give you some bit of a background. Uh, achievements, lesson learned, way for and some key messages that I want to share. So uh, for our background, <clears throat> uh, we have a research network um, that we call Triple L. Triple L stands for Landscape, uh, life, Livestock and Livelihoods in East African drylands. This is mainly um, a research composed of uh, scientists uh, from various institutions. We have several projects that we are currently undertaking that are all focusing on issues of uh, developing options for regional restoration and management options together with the communities. And the one is Dryland Restore, which is funded by farmers in Sweden. 
The other one is pastoral is paradox that is focusing on land tenure and climate change. Uh, the other one is a bigger one that has many partners, a dry run transform, and that's what I'll focus on uh, shortly, uh, which is coordinated uh, overall uh, by Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. It's a, I'm the country coordinator for uh, Kenya from sitting at the University of Nairobi. And in Uganda, it's uh, coordinated from Makerere University. And uh, with this uh, research that is layering on each other, uh, we draw on quantitative and qualitative research since 2016 within uh, the three, uh, these three separate projects that also address the aspects of restoration of degraded legends, pastoralist uh, tenure and land rights. So for dry land transform, it's a multidisciplinary research project that is titled Achieving the SGDs in East African Drylands, Pathways and Challenges Towards a Socio-Ecological Transformation of Landscapes, Livestock and Livelihoods uh, that is funded by farmers uh, in, from CEDA. And with Dryland Transform, we aim to contribute to knowledge for implementation and achievements of the SGDs in the East African Drylands and optimize synergies while minimizing trade-offs between the SGDs by developing the transformative pathways through policy and practice. So our goal is mainly to feed to the policy and the practice that is happening on the ground. And for specific objectives of dry run transform, we want to, we have already begun this work uh, since early uh, 2021, assessing land health at landscape level scale and ex uh, explore the links between human well-being. That work is being led by ECRAF. And uh, we also want to test options to restore ragelands at a gra grazing by engaging local communities and develop platforms to share knowledge and scale livestock interventions that promote resilience and productivity. And I'll tell you more about that. We are calling this model the livestock phase. And in number three, we want to understand the impact of climate variability on livelihood strategies and resilience. In number four, we are looking at the identifying innovative land governance mechanisms and practices that effectively address pastoralist production systems dependence on flexible, uh, both flexible and secure rights to land. And we are also synthesizing all these information so that we can have uh, messages and uh, um, uh, engagement with the policy uh, makers and also at the pra practice uh, level. The project area for dry land transform is uh, in uh, two agro pastoral areas that is Chepar area in uh, West Pokot County and its counterpart in the Kenya Karamoja border region of Kenya and Uganda is in Matanyi in Napak district. And the pure pastoral areas, one is in Lokiriyama near the border uh, in Trukana County, and the other one is in Lupa. Uh, and I'll revisit uh, that again. So the approach we are using is a livestock cafe model. And here we are training the uh, livestock keepers on various technologies for restoring uh, degraded land. Uh, for those who have visited uh, Trukana County, you know the extent of the degradation that is there, and also uh, West Pokot, parts of West Pokot, and other counties in Northern Kenya. So here we are saying we are co-generating knowledge and co-learning together, and then eventually bringing uh, livestock keepers, extension staff, uh, county and district, uh, by district I mean in the Uganda part, policymakers, uh, NGOs and other private actors and researchers together so that we can have a conversation. And this, uh, I just want to show you some of the things that we have achieved so far uh, for uh, on the ground as part of developing the demo site for li Livestock Cafe. These photos are from West Pokot, Chepalilia. The photo, I don't know whether you can see my casa. That's the original status of uh, the, the land, how it was in uh, July, 2021. This is the land we got to work with. 
and we moved in quickly to do water harvesting together with the communities. So now they know if you uh, install the water harvesting, uh, then it can capture water instead of all the water running downstream. And then we receded with the uh, uh, rangeland grasses, indigenous rangeland grasses, and also fodder legumes. Then there was uh, the land was heavily guarded, like Kashariba Ward in West Pokot, heavily guarded. All the soil seed bank have been uh, depleted, so we needed to we used vetiver grass, Keresopogons is noidis, uh, to try to control the water that is causing these gardens. And these places for the previous rain season, there has not been the um, enlargement of the garden mouth. We have also trained the uh, livestock keepers on using local materials that are available to try to address the uh, stopping the sediment uh, going downstream and also uh, capturing water in situ. So for enriching pastures uh, with forage legumes, we have trained so that uh, the, the pastures that are restored are of better quality. So these are the grasses species normally that we use for reseeding. They are very good indigenous and they have high biomass and also the legumes like Crotararia, Clitoria, Cilatro and Newton YT. We have also used uh, Doricos and we are doing experimentation to see the performance with and without manure. So these are just pictorial to inform you like how, how the site was in May 2022 and September. So what I want to state here is that with good rainfall or the rainfall of whatever area that you are, you, we can be able to achieve good restoration. But we know the uh, key issue is in the management. In Rupa, in Moroto, and also Matani, we have also been able to do oversowing because there was existing hyperennia grasses. So we overstone with other grasses and legume uh, forages. But we looked also at the nutrition aspect of the women and, and children under five. And we, uh, because when we did the baseline survey, the MUAC tip uh, was showing the prevalence of malnutrition or other nutrition. And we came in and started training the women on kitchen garden. And you can see here them in Chepareria being trained on um, the, the, kids, uh, the banana circle. And here after some time after establishing, sorry. Next slide. Okay, okay, thank you. Now, um, we, we have uh, the, the we, women and men and youth who are also trained on uh, uh, for example, here you can see the contour, the contour gardens, for example, just establishing a contour and then establishing a garden uh, 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 along, uh, along the contour. And uh, the photo on the right um, is uh, the harvest. They just did the first harvest uh, of that uh, demonstration site. Yeah, uh, after training the TOTs, um, on uh, kitchen gardening. Uh, eventually they were trained on produce harvesting and seed saving. And you can see there, a lot of produce have uh, been produced from the demo site in uh, Chepareria. And uh, they have taken in a lot of lessons, especially harvesting water for crop and fodder production. And also here, uh, we can see that uh, a household just needs a small uh, plot and then they will be food and nutrition secure because they were trained uh, on growing in diversity. Next slide. So we uh, have learned a lot, uh, a number of lessons and one uh, on how to achieve the large scale legend restoration. We can see, for example, that uh, when you have a bare degraded uh, legend, often there is need to and cross to exclude the livestock out. And that is controversial, is uh, seen as uh, uh, not good. Uh, and also, but we know that uh, this uh, uh, in triple L we regard encroachers as a way of management, is a, is a form of management. Um, and you can see that, for example, on the left, we have uh, 
an enclosure just done with a, a local plant material, a thorny cut, a thorn bush, uh, because the, the owner is a, a growing a pastures. Uh, that's a form of a private enclosure. So enclosures can be very different from private to communal enclosures like in Baringo for intensification or conservation. And uh, if you look to the light, you see the map of Laikipia. So you find that we have different use, different scale and different exclusion. Uh, Laikipia has been characterized historically by enclosures and conservancies, uh, including private ranches. Uh, but because of the high density of wildlife, uh, they allow wildlife to move from one enclosure or a private ranch to another. So when we consider large scale, next slide, we will consider, um, for example, from this uh, conceptual diagram, and this is the, the next um, the spanner I want to throw. Um, if you look at the, the red line, which represents fragmentation. So this uh, gives us relationship between climate, food security, landscape fragmentation, resilience and population density. And the X axis is of course finite, but not large, uh, likely to change in the near future. Um, but the global population is, uh, will continue to rise. So as fragmentation increases, food security and also uh, uh, resilience may go higher in the, sh in the, in the mid term. As we have seen, for example, in West Pokot, private enclosures being managed better, communal enclosures in Baringo being managed better, but fragmentation cannot uh, increase indefinitely. There has to be a level because if it increases indefinitely, then there'll be a crash. So what is this uh, optimal level of uh, fragmentation? And that is the question that uh, uh, the debate that we have to have. Next slide. Then uh, I put for you here a conceptual figure of suggested systematic coexistence between pastoral and agro-pastoral strategies um, and between different land use and different tenure system. Whereas the areas uh, in small squares are dominated by enclosures, for example, red dots are degradation hotspots. And these are areas where restoration efforts would start. I mentioned about the initial status and uh, as other presentations have, have shown, initial status very degraded. These are degradation hotspots. But uh, to bring this to the national and the international discourse, maybe of carbon crediting and uh, also restoration of regions, you see that we need uh, to continue with the restoration effort. But at landscape scale, we have to see it in a way that for example, can allow grazing corridors, the green line, and also wildlife movements. And if you see like the pear shaped, uh, that is the, the shape of West Pocot, the green uh, shapes on the left represents, for example, the hills in uh, Moroto district in Uganda. So when it becomes too harsh, the, past, uh, the pastoralist and agropastoral would have an opportunity to move towards Uganda, and that's the case. Even now we have found that people, uh, the pastoralists from Kacheriba migrate to Uganda and some livestock stay there like almost permanently, but the milk has come back uh, to continue sustaining uh, the, the, the households. So uh, some of the lessons learned uh, out of the years of work is that restoration ecology works if we harvest water, we do receding on with grasses, with the forage legumes, intercropped, and the multipurpose tree planting that is fruit trees, fodder trees, and wood trees, and all that. This will work. That has no problem. But we know the problem will be in the governance and management of those restored areas. So that is why we need to bring multi stakeholder and uh, uh, broader management, transdisciplinary, and multi-stakeholder approaches to address this. Another lesson, research projects like what we are doing, the NGOs work, 
have limited budgets and time frames. So we need to layer and sequence for the value chain development projects needed beyond the community's learning curve so that we don't always start uh, at the beginning. If our funds and period ends here, then someone else can come and in production, someone else, another organization can come and uh, take the community in value addition, another one in market. So coordination at county or district level is needed. We, we stop working in silos, which is ineffective and inefficient. And for Kenya, for example, NDMA can take up such a role in their offices at the count, asylum counties. And also we need to invest more in good times as opposed to only during emergencies. So uh, opportunities exist. Kenya is facing a major forage deficit estimated at 70% of the annual for the requirements. That's about 5.5 billion bales. And you know, a zebu cow uh, during drought can consume half a bale per day. So we can budget. Uh, and uh, there is a big opportunity for commercial fodder and fodder seed production for individuals, community groups, and private en enterprises. And I agree, I agree with Amina uh, that we need to entrench the youth in uh, this fodder opportunity as the community uh, uh, is transitioning to more private and more commercial uh, pastoralism and agro-pastoralism. So these are actions, these are messages that are put there for us at counties. Uh, they will be shared on the slide, so I want to skip them. They are very key uh, for us, so you can follow the slide. And eventually, we want to go towards healthy regions and equitable access of pasture and water according to uh, the regional regional management strategic objectives of ICPAL. And this is uh, we, to all the IGAD regions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephen. Um, yeah, we can we can go to the next presentation, and that is um, from uh, Muga Meshak Muga from uh, from FAO. Meshak Muga, welcome. So good morning, everybody. My name is <clears throat> Meshak Muga from uh, FAO, coordinating uh, a project on. Um, restoration of arid and uh, semi-arid lands of Kenya through bioenterprise development and other incentives. This is part of a, a global program called the Restoration Initiative, which is in uh, 10 countries and uh, having 11 child projects. In Kenya, we have two child projects, and this is one of them, which is being implemented by FAO uh, together with Kefri and other partners. And uh, this project is uh, in uh, two landscapes. We have Mukogodo landscape in Laikipia and the Siolo counties. And then we also have Mount Kulal landscape in uh, Marsabit County. So what makes this restoration initiative unique is the fact that uh, it is uh, also tackling the development of bioenterprises because most of the restoration initiatives just uh, focus on the restoration of the land, but uh, there, are no, there are no benefits, there are no immediate benefits to uh, the community. So our low-lying fruits are the bioenterprise development. So as part of the introduction, uh, the potential area for restoration in Kenya is about 39 million hectares. And for the project site, it's about 10 million hectares. And all of us are aware that Kenya has committed herself to restore 5.1 million hectares by 2030. And our project targets um, a direct restoration of 8,700 hectares and indirect restoration of 55,352 hectares. And the project has got uh, four components, one on policy development integration, uh, for component two is the real, the actual restoration uh, program. Then component three is dealing with uh, institution finance and upscaling. And component four is dealing with knowledge uh, management, knowledge sharing, issues of partnerships, monitoring and assessment. In terms of the achievement, uh, in, in partnership with several other partners, we've been able to do what we call restoration opportunities assessments, 
this is one of the activities that we did first in these sites. And now we have uh, the opportunities identified for each of the sites and we used uh, the ROM methodology. In terms of the policy documents, uh, we have been able to develop under the leadership of uh, Kenya Forest Service, we have been able to develop uh, uh, a national document on forest and landscape restoration implementation plan, uh, which has been finalized. We are just waiting for the signing and, uh, and the launch. The signing has been delayed because of the change in uh, the offices at the Ministry of Environment. And then we have also been able to develop two forest, participatory forest uh, management plans, one for Mount Kulal and another one for Mkogodo. These are uh, in the final stages. We have also been able to support the three counties in the development of uh, county environment action plans, which are really, really very critical uh, documents. And uh, in the development of these county environment action plans, we have asked them to include FLR, forest and land landscape restoration activities. And uh, this is critical in the sense that now, as these counties are developing the CIDPs, uh, they are going to use uh, whatever is in the county environment action plans to develop the CIDPs. Because now when we have the FLR, FLR activities, FLR activities, FLR activities launched, FLR activities launched in uh, entrenched, entrenched in, uh, in the CIDPs, then we are sure that uh, uh, this, this FLR activities are going to be funded by the county governments. We also have a policy influencing plan that we have developed that can be useful to all the partners that are here and the various county governments. Uh, in co collaboration with the NRT, we have uh, developed uh, resource maps for various uh, conservancies in uh, like Kipia County, which are useful documents. We have also been uh, able to establish eight tree nurseries and uh, trained um, uh, 120 uh, community members, 50 men and uh, 70 female. And this is critical so that now when the project ends, then uh, we'll be able to sustain uh, FLR activities at uh, the community level. Uh, two nurseries have been developed in, uh, in certain schools in Laikipia, and uh, these are being managed by the environment uh, clubs in those schools. And we have seen this as a, a very important vehicle of uh, now training the young people on a nursery establishment and the tree growing. And this is going to go a long way in sustaining these efforts beyond the project period. Uh, that is what I was talking about now. Some of this, these are, uh, this is tree planting in schools in Kogodo ecosystem. A number of uh, conservancies or community areas in uh, Kogodo ecosystem, uh, the community members have been supported to prepare micro catchments that are useful in tapping water during uh, the rainy season. And uh, as a result of the water, you can be able to see the slide on the right, how regeneration is taking place. So that is uh, just a, an indication of uh, the way the land looked before. And now the land after the preparation of the micro catchments and then after the rains. As much as we have uh, realized that uh, Development or the preparation of the micro catchments by the local communities is uh, important in the sense that now the community are getting involved in this particular work. Uh, we have also appreciated that uh, restoration, especially in the Asal areas, is a massive work and requires a lot of uh, resources and also requires a lot of time. And if you are to achieve a large area, it is important to supplement uh, the manual work with a mechanized, mechanized work or mechanized way of uh, uh, making the micro catchments. In the pictures, uh, we have a, a technology that was developed by an Italian, and he tried this in 2004, 2006, in uh, Isiolo and Mansabit areas with a lot of success, and also in the eastern part of the dryland, eastern part of Kenya. And uh, this, is, this system is called the Valerani system. It makes, um, there's a tractor with the two set of plows, depending on what you want to plant. And it makes some uh, micro catchments that are about 2.5 feet uh, in depth. And uh, after the micro catchments have been made, you can either use direct seeding or uh, you can use seedlings. Or uh, the other alternative is just to work, work out the land and leave it. And then uh, uh, the plants will uh, just naturally grow from, uh, from, the, from the seed bank.
in the soil. So that's that's the macro catchment, the way it looks. So you can either plant right inside the basin or or on the bank of, uh, of the basin. So one of the other activities that uh, we have also been able to support uh, through in partnership with the Laikipia Forest Forum, like 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 uh, wildlife forum is a rehabilitation of our uh, uh, water uh, infrastructures in most of these areas uh, water is a serious problem and uh, most of the, the water sources are in the forest so we have tried to rehabilitate at least six water infrastructures and now once these have been rehabilitated so the movement into the forest by wildlife and by especially the domestic animals and um, um, the community, local communities is reduced because now they can be able to get water close, close to close to their homes, and this is also helping in um, conserving in conserving uh, the forest. So that's another critical activity that our project has been able to do. So, as I mentioned earlier in, uh, in the title of our project, uh, is the issue of bio enterprise development. So we have been able to identify. Uh, 14 bioenterprises, then we narrowed down to after value chain analysis, we value, we, we value, we, we, um, we, we narrowed down to four gums and resins, which are uh, very critical and very common in these areas and we've got uh, international um, uh, markets. Then we have uh, bee, honey and bee products. We have aloe and also ecotourism. So we identified the products. We have also identified the gaps uh, in the best practices for production, domestication, processing, and marketing. And these have been documented. Key stakeholders have uh, been identified and their roles have been mapped. A video has been produced. And now at the moment, uh, Kefri is uh, coming up with a national strategy on um, non-timber forest products, which is going to be a really critical tool or uh, instrument in uh, the development of this subsector. So we have also had uh, a lot of uh, knowledge management and sharing fora. We have had uh, about 20 products that have uh, knowledge products that have been produced. We have had several uh, meetings that have, uh, have been held. After these documents have been produced, there have been a lot of uh, consultations at the county uh, at the, the county level and also at the national level. No? Uh, the total number of beneficiaries is 21. Uh, 1,259, there is comparable males and females, number of males and females is just comparable next. So as much as we are promoting a restoration, if you go to Mkogodo Forest, you'll find that there's one ton uh, felling of trees in the area. And this is something that uh, we are uh, trying to, to train and uh, sensitize the communities to avoid uh, uh, one ton uh, felling of trees in these areas. We have also realized that uh, it is critical that uh, we have a uh, co-financing or um, synergies and complementarities. And in, in this project, we started in 2019, we have been able to get support from World Vision, uh, the Regreening Africa and Imara, then uh, Kefri, C4 Aircraft, uh, the UK Park Program, uh, WWF. Uh, we have also been able to get support from other the restoration initiative partners, UNEP and Nature Kenya, and NACOFA, uh, National Alliance of Community Forest Associations, among others, have uh, supported our program. So key lessons learned, uh, just a summary of uh, the many key lessons. That one is that uh, we need to have uh, to consider mechanized systems, as, as I just said, in restoration of asal areas. We need to sensitize local communities on protection of work sites because we may do a lot of restoration activities, but if they are not protected, then there's a problem. We also need to liaise with the universities to come up with training courses and applied research on, on FLR and non-timber forest products. We also need to prioritize uh, land tenure stroke um, community land ownership in ASALs because uh, the major problem in uh, asal areas is that uh, the land is communally owned. And now when you do restoration activities in communally owned land, there's a problem. Then procurement of goods and services require early planning. Most of the institutions have got uh, long procurement processes. So that's one lesson that we have learned that we need to start planning early next. Synergies and components for greater impact. I would say that development of our enterprises are slow lying fruits. We have mentioned that public-private partnership is critical. And there are several opportunities 
uh, that uh, I've mentioned there, maybe I'll not go into that because of time. Thank you very much, Meshak. Um, now we will go to Michael Bolton's presentation. My name is Bolton Onyango. I'm a field researcher, range management consultant, working with uh, Enonkishu Conservancy, and uh, I'm also engaged with uh, SMB Kenya uh, on a project called Ixiapa, which means uh, integrated climate smart uh, for agro list across the counties that is Narok, Kajiado, and uh, Taita Taveta. And my area of focus mostly is uh, grazing systems, extensive uh, livestock production systems. Yes, and uh, today I'll be enlightening you a little bit about uh, how we assess monitoring, how we assess and monitor rangeland health for monitors. Uh, this is the outline. Uh, first and foremost, I will uh, appreciate the contributing organization towards this uh, presentation and the speakers. Yeah, uh, so Enonkishu is one of the contributing organizations. We also have the Northern Rangeland Trust and the WOCAT um, uh, organization. Next. Just a little bit of uh, background to paint a picture to all of us because uh, we've had a lot that uh, is being uh, done in the range and uh, sometimes we tend to forget this challenge that we are facing. Currently, as of 2021, the rangelands cover 54% of the global terrestrial surface. Of the 54%, 54 78 of those range, 78% of that uh, rangeland cover is classified as drylands. And uh, it covers 41% uh, at land mass. <clears throat> and uh, it's important to note that uh, these rangelands support almost a third of the world's population who are mostly, uh, and who are, whose livelihoods is dependent on rangeland, range natural resources, besides uh, the rangelands holding a wide, a wide range of biodiversity, such as the uh, key stone species. Yeah? They also act as the important urban sinks. <clears throat> Just to bring it, bring it home, uh, the rangelands cover 3% of uh, the land mass in Africa. And it hosts it two hundred and forty million agrofossilists and twenty five million fossilists. That's right. Now that you have that picture in your mind, uh, it's important that we have several challenges that we are trying to address in the rangelands, and uh, one of them includes climate change and variability. We also have high levels of uh, soil and land degradation and uh, biodi biodiversity loss. All the uh, challenges are exacerbated by uh, human activities, which are coupled with uh, complex social cultural factors, such as uh, poor, poor rangeland management practices, also a breakdown in traditional, uh, traditional decision-making systems. Also, there is incre increasing human and livestock populations in the rangelands, and uh, also widespread poverty and health. Uh, we've seen that in Kenya, we are facing have in the rangelands. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, these challenges has caused us or has uh, sort of made us to rise up, you know, as institutions and key development uh, partners to develop uh, restoration initiatives and activities uh, to try and reverse this uh, rangeland degradation. And uh, one of the key aspects that I'm going to right now is uh, especially on monitoring and uh, assessing the rangeland health for various reasons, including uh, targets such as land degradation and uh, United <coughs> UN decade of for ecosystem restoration. Yes, so how are we addressing these key issues or these challenges? We've had uh, a lot of discussions uh, in the previous slides on uh, the various interventions that different stakeholders are um, applying or approaches that they're applying to at least try and uh, the land degradation. But, uh, it's also pertinent enough or pertinent that we also include the assessing and the monitoring bit of our impact that we are imposing on, on land. It's also important to note that uh, rangelands are socio-ecological systems and uh, we, we openly tend to 
uh, separate the two, you know, social bit and the ecological bit. And uh, it's important to note that the two work in synergy and you can't separate the two. Therefore, uh, I've scoured across um, various institutions and what uh, the approaches that using and it, they all um, summarized into this uh, concept that we call rangeland health concept, where you try as much as possible to assess and monitor the degree to which uh, the integrity of air, water and soils and the, the rangeland ecosystem processes are in such so as you can balance uh, them for sustainability. And uh, the key attributes of rangelands that are being assessed and monitored across all situations summarize uh, into soil stability, uh, integrity of bionic, biotic community is also hydrologic uh, function. Now, let me take you to the context of uh, just a few organizations that uh, were able to present or to <coughs> showcase their approaches. And one of them is the non Kishu Conservancy, which is uh, a very small conservancy uh, occurring around 4,000, that is in the northern part of the Mara ecosystem. And uh, the approach is uh, through bio, bio monitoring, what they call biomonitoring. And uh, the main aim of is actually assessing the soil ecosystem processes, that is the nutrient cycle, the water cycle, and the energy flow. Um, all these uh, ecosystem processes have got indicators that are measured against uh, along transects that are laid across the landscapes. And one of them is the uh, functional composition and of uh, the species. This is where we, they focus more in whether they are bare grounds, uh, also issues around annual and perennial, you know, uh, species that are available. Also, they look more into the plant spacing, you know, the plant bases, how much of it is covered? Do you have more of uh, bare grounds in your land or not? Another indicator they look at, uh, at is the soil erosion. Uh, you can see the picture in front of you in the middle. You can see is one of the indicators. You have those flow patterns on bare grounds. That tells you that there's a break in the water cycle. Uh, and the last one, among many indicators that I didn't uh, include here for matters of time, is uh, the rate of decomposition of litter. This is more. This will give you a more insight into the <coughs> into the mineral cycle. Yeah, uh, are you actually incorporating um, the minerals back into the soil? Where this next one is in the context of North and Rangeland Trust, and uh, more more or less they are all the same. Yes, in the context of context of uh, Rangeland Trust, uh, those are the indicators that they look into. I'm going to congratulate uh, NRT for actually picking up this indicator and using it to train. Uh, the satellite uh, data, or I mean satellite uh, technology, you know, using it as train data for you to be able to cover large landscapes. <clears throat> yeah, the last one is the context of FOCAT, uh, where they focus more into land degradation neutrality framework and the uh, UNCCD uh, framework of reporting. And uh, those are the indicators that they look at when they are doing the assessment and monitoring. Uh, so these are the lessons learned by those institutions and very many others. We do have several in, uh, uh, indicators and metrics to measure rangeland health. Um, assessment of this monitoring uh, of these indicators are done through either ground truthing or using remote sensing indices. However, these have limitations. For instance, you have false positive where you can find desert forests. Yeah, below the trees, you have no cover and you know very much that uh, we need grass, you know, for soil cover. Other is like a selection of sites for monitoring. You know, the heterogeneity of rangelands make it, makes it difficult to actually choose a site that is well representative of the rest of the, of the areas. Yeah. Another thing is the vastness of land, uh, which makes it difficult to actually traverse and do some truth in data. So I choose to look at uh, the challenges that we are facing as opportunities. And uh, there is need for a sustain sustainability index for land. Uh, where it incorporates harmonized indicators and also provides a platform for us to uh, present, you know, all these findings. Also, uh, we do have uh, tools that are simple to use, you know, at the palm of your hands. For instance, land KS is 
uh, we ne enable you to monitor range lands um, at the palm of your hands, which is also available to everyone. It's open source. Eh? Yes. So what are the what is the way forward, or which actions do we need to take? Uh, we need a platform or a framework to share rangeland health monitoring data between institutions. You, you've seen we are doing a lot, quite a lot. And uh, we also need to think of ways of how we can communicate the same results that we are getting from uh, monitoring and assessing the rangeland to the wider community. Uh, like I would like to echo Dixon Kylo's uh, words. He said that uh, we need to shift from doing conservation and rangeland restoration for the community. Yeah? Conservation and rangeland restoration by the community themselves. Yes, uh, I'm going to issue a rallying call to several uh, uh, relevant stakeholders to kindly build the capacities to local community in assessing and monitoring rangelands. We've seen, uh, we are engaging the communities in restoring, but what about in assessing and monitoring the same activities that we are having on the ground, such that even after the key stakeholders and development partners are, have gone, uh, are the communities able to capture, are they able to assess their own uh, rangeland or their own natural resource? Another support that we need, uh, <clears throat> need to take this conversation now to a national uh, level where there's an initiative of all the key stakeholders, including government, uh, to sit down and we agree yeah, as rangeland players and set aside a budget for capacity for assessing and monitoring our own rangelands. Eh? And the same, making the same results available uh, to every at the country country level. Yeah. Finally, uh, even after we've spoken about all those challenges and uh, activities that we are doing, it's important to note that there's a hope. There's hope. Whatever we are doing, it's not uh, it's not really to say that they are not paying us. It's not paying. You can see from the photos actually that the management uh, perspectives that we have from different institutions, uh, we are restoring the rangelands. And uh, this is just one way of displaying what we are doing, you know, as uh, stakeholders and uh, key development partners in different rangeland ecosystems. I think that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, um, for the wonderful presentation. So now we go to the last presentation of today from uh, Dr. Hans-Peter Liniger. Yes, it's how to enhance resilience to the ch change in climate. We've had quite some discussion about that topic here. My name is Hans-Peter Liniger. And I'm yeah, the former director of WOCAT. I've been working uh, in Laikipia in Kenya for a long time, 10 years I stayed there. And I've been in, involved in several programs since uh, over 30 years. So this is uh, the picture here and now the background to the myths and facts of climate change. We discussed that quite at length. I think temperature is clear. We have an increasing trend. On rainfall, we have to say it's highly variable in time and space. space. The perceptions are that rainfalls are generally de declining. But uh, when people say this, this is mostly not based on measurements, but on, on observations that the rangelands are becoming less green than before. So the factor is that rainfall in total is not below average. In some places, it has even been going up. In other places, it is fluctuating. You see here two the stations. We try to compile a number of them to see how what is happening. And uh, uh, so it is not really going down. The, the recent drown is a serious uh, situation, but it's not part of a downwards trend towards having less and less rain. We still think we have uh, not too many long-term records to prove what is really happening with uh, rainfall. Here, just a few examples how it is variable in, 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 in time and space. We realize that um, uh, the space variability comes a lot because of the mountain systems that uh, provide completely different situations about where long rains and short rains are better. Are the long rains increasing and uh, or decreasing? The short rains increasing. We realize that basically the the long rains in many places are going down or have been going down over the last uh, 20, 30 years. 
that as the short grains have become more reliable and they're going up. So rainy days, there are less uh, rainy days, but when it rains, it's more, there's more rain uh, than uh, per day than before. So it, this indicates we are having heavier storms. Dry spells are also more variable. So they, they, uh, when they occur, and uh, the tendency is also that they're becoming longer. So all could go into looking at these graphs, but uh, in time in, to save time. All was this, what this means, we need a high resilience of the land to cope with these extreme events and um, with these climate uh, situations. Now, the key issue, now addressing it, you see again the rainfall on top of here on the right top. You see the variability, the annual one, the, 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 the longer term uh, fluctuations. And for the same period of time here, from the 60s to the 2015, we have uh, the peaks of the flow in the Wasoniro, not only the peaks, the daily flows, but you can see nicely the, what is happening with the peaks. So the peak flows are increasing over that period of time, even during a period when it is, yeah, there was a bit of a higher one here, but here it is not uh, too high. We're getting a general trend except the 61 uh, El Nino situation. So over the same period of time from the 60s to the 2010, we have a decreasing uh, situation for the, for the dry season flow. So the, the, the peaks increasing, we would say this is land management because it's not cannot be, be related to have more rain, stronger rainfalls. And the decreasing one is also land management and it's also related to abstractions, we've seen that. So too much followed by too little, that's a syndrome that I call, and it shows there's a relationship be, uh, between upstream and downstream uh, land use and uh, the land use, land use change is causing such a syndrome. And this is aggravated, but, but not caused by um, uh, climate change. Now, and a key issue I would like to, to point out, we've been looking at the surface temperature that are uh, related to the cover cover conditions. This here is in Samburu area, where you see next to each other, the different temperatures of the surface in the afternoon. 33 degrees, 41 degrees. Now, what would you say? Which one is the highest one? Is it the right one on the stone, on, on the bare rock? Or is it the one on, on, on the soil surface? Even if the rock is black here, in most of the situations, you would say that the rock gets hotter and, uh, than the soil. But in, in, in reality, when you measure it, and I measured it in many places, the soil gets at least as hot, 63 degrees. It can go up to 70 degrees in many places. In most of the situations, the soil actually gets hotter than a stony surface of it. So that means the soil, these extreme surface temperatures, that they are destroy this is destroy destroying all the living organisms of the topsoil. We say the soil should be a living organism. It's creating a very unfavorable microclimate for grasses and for trees to establish. And it even has an impact on the macroclimate. So if anybody of you is interested, we did for the area, you see on the right hand side, you see the area that we covered. We did an analysis of, of the satellite uh, signals that we get in terms of temperature, uh, surface temperature. And we can see that um, on the left hand side, this is not the absolute temperature, it is the increase, these are hot spots, hot islands, the increase of temperature by uh, here in the 9 to 12 up to uh, over 20 to 22 degrees, the increase of the surface temperature, the maximum compared to situations next to it that have a good cover condition. So bare or gray situations that are degraded areas, they can have an increase measured by the satellite by over 20 degrees. Uh, and we are asking ourselves, what kind of impact does that have on the regional warming? It measured at two meters at it, uh, height above the ground. So anybody interested, please let me know. We're still following up. What does land management uh, do in terms of contributing to, to climate 
to global warming, original warming. So the other examples that is really, we, as we said before, if you want to cope with this one, we need to go for climate resilient rangeland management practices. And we showed that this has been also highlighted that we have a system to demonstrate this. It's, it's published here also in the, in the book that we can actually look uh, at the climate change extremes that have already happened in this situation here and then see where there where it was this system more or less uh, resilient. Did it cope well with these uh, gradual changes, uh, years that had above uh, average temperature? Did it also cope well with uh, droughts, with uh, high, high rainfall events? So this is an assessment that can be done based on experiences made uh, so far. Okay, what were the key principles when we analyzed it? They are listed here. Enabled mobility, rotation, good grass and herbaceous cover is key, securing dry season drought forage, community-based land use, land management practices, and then having emergency mar markets, also for animals, uh, in case you are in a serious drought situation. So you can contact here, WOCAT, I've given you the, 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 the list of the people who are con uh, continuing with WOCAT. This is a very nice example by Lucy, uh, I'm very fond of, uh, of that, and that would, it would have been nice if she could pre uh, present it. They're involving the young people to actually do monitoring in different areas where they have different managements uh, and the youth is monitoring it uh, and from the local community. The results are compared to when we, the result is that when they look at uh, what they get from the monitoring compared with the rainfall for various periods show that there is a decreasing grassland productivity even for the same amount of rainfall. And what is very nice here, what they are doing with this monitoring, they're giving kind of pressure gauges here that indicate where are, are we at the in the current situation. And if we had time, we could compare 2009 drought with the current drought and then compare and see what has what is the difference between the previous and this drought in terms of the indicators that we got already in the field by measuring the, the forage availability. So the way forward, opportunities, yes, there are quite a number of them. You see here, restoring degraded grasses here in, at the foot slopes of uh, uh, Kilimanjaro, the management of lice, livestock compared to the situation that you have on the right hand top side. And also then looking at what does that mean in terms of the women uh, adaptive capacity and, um, and also in terms of the youth. So what is really needed, the way forward, the conclusion from our work was documentation and sharing of resilient practices is absolutely key. Monitoring rainfall and river water and groundwater recharge, there is need for long-term data and proper analysis of it. The monitoring of the land use, land cover, land management, and the health. We've heard it already before. This is something that needs to be done. If we don't do this, we cannot really make decisions and assess where we are. These pressure gauges are very, very nice example. And as I said, this is already documented in that book. So the availability at any time of the, of the, 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 the year of the past is key to determine how severe the drought will be, where we are in the current situation. Good, so key message is let's not use climate change as a scapegoat for disasters and losing productivity and resilience. Land management is the key to improve resilience to extremes, both heavy rains and droughts. Improve cover, top soil condition is topmost. Then we would have to even prove that do, do we have a great impact of land management also on the microclimate that we already know, but also, also on the macroclimate of a region? And the resilient land management practices need to be shared and the impacts monitored. You can contact uh, Lucy and myself. I'm sorry, she couldn't present her part. So that's the first one. And then I would like to go to the other 
group work that we've been doing. It is this one here. Sorry that I'm doing two, but I keep them short. I think I'm in time. So this is something that was the topmost when we looked at all the key issues that are important. This was topmost of, uh, of a voting or of a survey that we did. Documentation and sharing of experiences, uh, the knowledge on good land management practices and their impacts. So we addressed that almost a year ago when we looked at what, what is really happening. So background is still that knowledge is still a most important hindering. And if you have good <laughs> available knowledge in another direction, also enable enabling factor for the uptake and spread of sustainable rangeland management. We did an internal uh, survey of the action group and um, we realized that many organizations have their own system for documentation and monitoring yet in, a very, uh, in various levels of comprehensiveness and not standardized, mostly used for internal report, presentation, case studies and publications. That's what we got out of the survey. Now the access to this knowledge, another result, is difficult and not open access. So it's mostly internal, clearly less for, and the knowledge is clearly less for rangelands than for cropland. So the continuity of this monitoring in many places is not secure and the updating is not systematic. You see a result on the right hand side when we did the rangeland book, where you see a number of uh, issues that are mentioned here and how much are they contributing to, to enabling or hindering good rangeland management practices. You can see the first one is ability, uh, availability of uh, financial resources. And the second one here is for hindering knowledge, for enabling less legal framework, but still we would also when it's hindering, it's also for enabling. So that indicates that that is still a key issue. So we can say that from, from, from our program, from that VOCAP program that is now run by a different group of people. I was involved for a long time, handed it over. VOCAD made an effort with the book Sustainable Rangeland Management in Sub-Saharan Africa. You have the link down there and the documentation of uh, sustainable rangeland practice, management practices. Kenya has the highest number of practices that are documented there. We made a bit of an effort to, to, to show more practices from Kenya. Yet the VOCAD platform is not widely used in Kenya for continued rangeland documentation and updating of new practices, as well as of their adaptations. So we are wondering, would, would that be a possibility? It's, a, it's an offer. But the key issues that are coming out for the documentation and sharing are, if we want to really share and talk to each other, we need a standardized and harmonized system with questionnaires that are collecting the information in the same way with same definitions. And then the second one is once we have a database, easy and open access. It needs to be able to, we need to be able to have a flexible search, how we want to, to look at the data and then provide easy outputs, analysis, reports, learning materials, knowledge products for various purposes. All what is listed here was our, was our basic mandate that we gave ourselves in VOCAT so that it is also the next one is widely used by extension service practitioners and then also students, planners, decision makers in different languages when we go to, to, to other regions. So one common database, this is very important, but with assigned ownership all the time when people are entering, it's not WOCAT who owns the data there. It's then the compilers, the people are still Ibrahim Yarso. We make the, the link to the institutions that has have been uh, involved in it and also to the person. They remain the authors and the, the owners of this uh, information. So the way forward, I think, yes, there is the book that pro provides a, a knowledge sharing platform that can be used suitable for rangeland documentation. We could show that. You can see on the right hand side how many practices worldwide are already in it. 
And you also see that it is recommended by UNCCD for documentation for the land degradation neutrality. So this is something that has a number of, of uh, benefits. And, uh, there are so many uh, projects and pra uh, practitioners that have experiences that could be still shared. It's use it, so our recommendation or our office, use it for mul multiple purposes to highlight the importance of rangelands, land degradation neutrality, I mentioned it, towards the international year of rangeland and pastoralism in 2026, reporting on initiatives of restoration the decade, there's so many going on now, climate change adaptation and mitigation, we even have one, if I press here, yes, we even have a, a module that addresses specifically for practices that are documented what, uh, what is happening in terms of climate change adaptation, how do they perform during extreme events, and also disaster risk re uh, reduction. So there's the, this has a separate module. We also have a gender module. So need to we need oh, to, uh, to, uh, we also need to share how the youth is in, involved. I really very much like the presentation of Amina for the youth. I think we need to, to show today what are attractive systems for young professionals. I don't mean school children for young professionals to work with the rangelands, to have an economic future, also have a, a pride and, and, and uh, uh, an acceptance in the society. Because if we don't have that, where will we be in, 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 in 20 years from now if the youth is not involved in doing rangeland management practices? So the way forward, actions uh, and support required, I put that all for the documentation and sharing. The survey also showed, we asked that, what would be needed? Is there a need for joint action for documentation and sharing in order to advance rangeland uh, restoration? You see several of the answers here. Yes, big need. MOs, we heard that already before, how people work together and, and, and uh, compile and use that information. More evidence on impacts are needed. Need for generous and specific budget lines and dedicated persons with allocation of time. We always came to the point that everybody is saying, yes, it's good to have this knowledge, but nobody has time or a budget on an allocation to do it. So we would really, for the way forward, we need to have, it's written here, a concrete plan for how to do that if we agree, and then what kind of funding is available and where are the people doing it. So, Need for capacity building, for monitoring and the evaluation, the documentation, and need for a coordinating organization within Kenya for the rangelands, maybe separate from the, crop, from the cropland, to follow up with different projects and experienced practitioners. You have the contact, me here, and then the, the VOCAT group of people that is working on it. So thank you for your attention. This is the last one and maybe showing that there is a wealth of such a wealth of information on, on the rangelands and yet we are not sharing it in the same language in an easy way with each other. And thus we cannot build up whatever people are doing on that knowledge. And that's really a big loss. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Hans-Peter. Thank you everybody for, for listening to the end of the presentations. Uh, because of time, we will not have the breakout sessions. We'll delve directly into the Q&A. And uh, we'll start with the last presentation. Uh, that is Hans-Peter's presentation. There is a, a question for you. And the question is, the dem demonstration plots or sites have good success. However, is there any community, is there any community, um, sorry, the, is there any community, um, sorry, something keeps interrupting me. Um, is there any community large scale adop adoption success story in Northern Kenya, including Laikipia, Samburu, Isiolo, ETC? Should I yes, repeat yes, the I, question? I, yes, I got the, yes, I got the question. Yes, I think, I think there is. 
uh, uh, if you look, if you look really, uh, whoever is interested or has put that question, look into the link that I gave to the book. You actually see a number Northern Rangeland Trust, Isiolo examples that are are put in it. Yes, they are. At the moment, what I have to say, and that is a big, big challenge, when we are in a very serious drought like we face now, all the arrangements, and I was told that, all the arrangements that people were making to secure like dry season fodder, to, to, to say when we, we, we securing some areas and we have a reserve, that one during this drought has been really attacked. And so every people came from everywhere Whatever community plans they were, how one is organized and sharing a, a, the, the, the area, what rotational system people have, how they're moving around, that was overruled by more and more people coming from the outside. That has been a very serious constraint. But you find in the book a number of very nice examples. You remember I was saying the basic principles like enabled mobility is one of them moving around, not continuous grazing, but a rotational grazing system, any system that is continuous, we found out, is not working. It deteriorates. The pieces of land can be having a high stock, the, the stocking density for a period of time, but then they need a rest, while animals are moving to the next, to the next situation. All right, Hans Peter, thank you. So the next question, uh, we go to Amina, Amina Malin. What's the most economic utilization of the invasive species? An economic model like biochar should be developed. So it's a question and a comment together. I would like to, that's a very good question. Thank you to whoever uh, asked the question. I would like to answer that as a researcher. And uh, some- They have such management strategies. And those are very easy to find out if we just talk with pastoralists, men and women. I'll give you a quick example. There was 30,000 acres of forest restored in Loragoom in Turkana. And people say, pastoralists restoring forest? Yes, with no fencing at all. They use social fencing. They use the social institutions and traditional knowledge of the landscape. This happened in 1980, 19, late 1980s, 30 years ago. I happened to visit the area two years ago and the forest was still being managed, still benefiting the pastoralists. And I was told in no uncertain terms that this forest is our Turkana forest, not your outsider or government forest. So there's a real issue there about how do we manage for restoration? It's not outsiders to manage, it's much more internal manage this implies then that we there's tends to be this still held separation between so-called scientific knowledge and so-called indigenous knowledge both are needed it's not to say that scientific knowledge is better than indigenous or vice versa both are needed and both need to be understood Thank you very much uh, for the comment. It's a very pertinent comment. Uh, Yatich, could you uh, quickly uh, say your question or comment? All right. So as I'm Yatich, on. okay, you're ready. Okay. I'm audible now, eh? Yes. Thank you. Now, my, my, my comments are just two. Uh, the first one, of course, is that I have uh, had experiences of working with the Minister of Water on land rehabilitation and reclamation in Hawaii. And one of the biggest challenges, which I really need to commend this, um, this, uh, this what we are doing right now, is um, finalizing policies and legislation that eventually can support land rehabilitation and degradation in Kenya. Because that is one of the biggest challenges that we face as a country. Unfortunately, degradation and, and, and land waste is a very slow process. As a result, uh, it is uh, only recognized after it has already been, that after it has already happened and led to a lot of waste. So there may be need in this discussion for us to be discussing uh, uh, how to support policies and legislation so that it can be able to enhance and widen the scope. Now the ministry, uh, which I used to work until a few weeks ago, as they've done a few of these rehabilitation issues in uh, some of the counties. 
And the challenge we face again is um, the political will. And that is something that uh, we need to really bring up so that we can uh, be able to look at the very many uh, investment tools that we can use to rehabilitate. And maybe the last one is a question I may want to ask. There was uh, a company in, in Baringo which had um, intended to use uh, this um, weed, this, um, what do you call this, um, to the pro, to the flora, the madenge, to produce the energy and it died. Would anybody be in the know on what happened to it? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, if anyone has a response to the last question, they can give us an answer and we will relate to you. So there are some questions uh, that were asked to Michael Bolton Onyango. Um, and the questions are, do you have any indigenous indicators for rangeland health? Okay. I was unable to unmute myself. But, uh, oh, okay. okay. Did you hear the question or should I uh, yes, repeat it? I've, I've heard the question. And uh, okay. yes, there are a couple of indicators, uh, indigenous indicators, and uh, it, it, it differs eh, from community to community. But uh, generally, one of them is uh, the tend to more on emergence of, say, poisonous plants eh, within the, the, their lands. Another one is uh, they tend to notice mostly when there's either an increase or a decrease in uh, shrubs. Sometimes uh, they also focus more on the palatable species or the blood forage species, which uh, they feel like they have, used, they have importance to their livestock. Uh, another one is uh, an indicator like soil mightiness. You know, uh, there is always that bit of uh, de developing uh, your feel and touch. Eh? So like uh, soil muddiness and uh, soil crusts, those are the things that they focus more on. I hope I've answered the question. All right, uh, Michael, there is another one. Um, yes. Great to see action with positive results. NRC has been mentioned a few times. Are these yes. initiative, initiatives linked to their carbon scheme? Uh, well, yes, um, from the little I know about uh, NRT, I think uh, that's part of the scheme in um, monitoring. It's still in development, of course, but um, those indicators and even more, uh, they're part of the, pro the carbon project in the north. All right, thank you. Um, there is also a comment um, for you, Stephen Muradi. At uh, Gravy's Zebra Trust, we have been facilitating community use of semicircular bands for resource trapping, similar to your work. The communities are implementing this in Wamba region, Westgate, Kalama, and Maybay, Maybay conservancies, but the bottleneck has been multiple failed rains. We are hopeful, hopeful that the April rains will be better so we can better evaluate the success. Grazing planning in these conservancies at the zonal level have been more demonstrably successful at a larger scale, though again, then has been a massive bottleneck. So that is a comment from a Gravis Zebra Trust, um, which has also been mentioned in some of the presentations. They have been an active member of the action group. Um, and those are the comments that I can highlight uh, for now. Um, there is also a question uh, for everybody. If you would like to share your contacts with the participants, uh, and you know, and the links to how they can access your work, you can uh, share it on the chat, and the participants will get it. Um, but uh, from my end, that is all the questions we have for now. Caroline, yes, Susan has raised her hand. Okay, Susan, you can ask. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would just wish to respond to to the Prosopis factory in Baringo. It was closed because of uh, probably a challenge in the machinery where the waste from uh, the prosopi, burning Prosopis was uh, clogging, the gum was clogging uh, part of the machine and uh, a process take a, that, that takes two weeks would clog the machines, then it would take another one month or two to clean the machine. So it was not, uh, efficient enough, so the process were not efficient and not cost uh, effective. So I think uh, they closed for further research 
uh, despite the big investment they had. So we've not had any much communication further to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kavira? Yes, Amina? Uh, to support uh, what Susan has said on the post office, because I've also worked in Baringo for a while, and um, the factory, first of all, uh, was pioneered in, uh, in Ma I think, in Malaysia, where they were using rice husks to generate electricity. And now in, in Kenya, they set it up to use uh, the prosopis biomass to generate electricity, but they didn't check uh, that there was the, what do you call the moisture content what, what was what was bringing the, the soot and uh, disrupting the disrupting the residue which was methane that was supposed to have been harvested out and sold to companies and then the the various processes that were happening in the machines were kind of uh, interfering so the biomass put and the energy generated were not um, uh, equal so there was a lot of uh, wastage and uh, low energy being produced so they had put it uh, i don't know afterwards i've left there 2018 afterwards if they had done anything else but uh, they were to look at to revise and see how they can replace those machineries and uh, and see how best they can generate and also as for the the supply or uh, the what do you call the availability of the post office uh, biomass i think that was uh, okay but the only the machinery issue was the problem. Yeah. Thank you, Amina. And uh, while we are still on you, um, I'll ask you one more question that, that came from the from the participants. Um, mm -hmm. Where is the market for a indica pods? Taita uh, Taveta, we mingle Kishusha area, have them in plenty, and they are just infested by wildlife and others dying on the trees. I believe they can earn livelihood from the pots. What? Um, where is the market for a indica pods? Oh, as a director, indica pods. Yes. Uh, I have never seen a ma uh, market for as a director indica pods. All I know is, uh, but I can ask uh, uh, some uh, my colleagues in the institute. And I can get back to the, the person who asked uh, the question. But all I know is uh, that Director Indica was, uh, is the best species right now that can grow anywhere in, within our dry land. And uh, getting the pods, we have not seen anywhere where people, most of the communities, what they do is you borrow from your neighbor and uh, you go and plant it in your, in your compound or even in schools, students are given, uh, the pupils are given some, and then they just go and plant it within, the, within schools. But I've not seen somewhere where they are selling them, they're buying them, not unless there is a big restoration project that requires the co to buy, to buy the, seed, the seeds from the communities. Yeah, but I can get the contact of the person who asked and I can get back to him or her. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So the person who asked the question, kindly uh, share your contacts with Amina or us. Then when she has an answer, she will give you the answer. Uh, I'm told Rashid has raised his hand. Could you come in and ask your question? Hello. Hello. Yeah, my name is Rashid Mohammed. Uh, I come from a community-based organization based in Mandera called Arilands Action Forum. Uh, my question is just uh, to Mr. Stephen Murevi, and uh, I would wish to ask this question. In a dichotomy context of uh, uh, enclosures, that is private enclosure and communal enclosure, what is your experience uh, uh, of the challenges you can share with us uh, as, as regards this two particular aspect? That is... Uh, the private enclosure and the communal enclosure. And then I will also want to present to the larger uh, speakers that uh, our focus looks like, uh, in terms of uh, restoration of uh, dry lands, uh, we are trying to focus where there is already some kind of, you know, 
uh, because arid areas, I, I mean, drylands is uh, divided into semi-arid and arid. There is a lot of focus on semi-arid. What are we going to do so that we shift our, there is a paradigm shift also in terms of our focus to particular arid, arid areas where there is uh, in, 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 in perspective of you know communal land and uh, how we intend to do even if it is you know participatory, participatory rest, uh, restoration management of drylands. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, Dr. Stephen Moretti, could you answer? Uh, thank the you very much. Thank you very much, Rashid. I, if I understood your question well, you asked about uh, um, the challenges of. Um, uh, private and uh, communal enclosures, am I right? Yes. Yes, um, the, the two, uh, as I see, for example, if you take the, the examples in Chaparelia, which is dominated by uh, private enclosures in West Pocot and also parts of Baringo, uh, we have seen that uh, when uh, private enclosures maybe there is a higher level of management and uh, also possibly benefits that the private individual draws from this enclosure. And that have, we have some data that have been published by Wairori et al. And also from the communal perspective, it is possible to draw uh, uh, also a higher level of benefits as opposed to the open range land as uh, ex exemplified by uh, cases of Baringo, uh, but uh, also anything communal also have its, its challenges. If the governance is not right, for example, the benefits sharing, then it introduces another dynamic. And uh, that's why I said the ecology will work, but we need to get it right at the governance level. And uh, I wholly agree with the point of Edmund that uh, of uh, core generation of uh, knowledge and core learning, as I had stated, because we have to learn with the people as the scientists, but they themselves have, um, people have a, a justification of wh why they do what they do. And that is where we need to get it right. And then uh, the, the, your second question on uh, the bias on semi-arid. I think uh, semi-arid uh, restoration uh, becomes easier uh, because of higher rainfall, but with rain harvesting, and I want to insist here, rain harvesting, it is possible also to restore areas that are arid in Trukana and, uh, and uh, Wajia and Garissa and Mandera, it is, it is possible. Uh, but we need to capture any moisture that comes through rain in situ uh, so that to give, for example, the grasses, the trees, uh, the, the moisture needed for growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe one, one answer from uh, the, pre the presenters, the other presenters on the last question of Rashid. Anybody who has an opportunity to answer? Okay. Yes. 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 And you can search in it. You can actually then find out what is happening in Kenya and the arid environment, which practices have been documented there. But what I mean is if you really want to know more and we want to have more solutions available, we also need to have people who are willing to share and make a bit of an effort or have a, a support to make that effort to document and, 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 and present their experiences. That is something I would really see as a topmost priority for the, for the future now, 
that we say, okay, how can we get together? How can we get the resources that people have time allocated and possibility, not only to look for solutions, but also to present what they already have, knowledge that they already have, and maybe also help traditional or indigenous uh, systems, how they can be uh, reported, uh, not only project experiences. So when only when all this gets together, we have a, a solid foundation to analyze and see what is happening in which environment, when does it change, what kind of, are the variations, how are people adapting to changing conditions, then we would have the possibility, or you, everybody has the possibility to analyze that. But it's only happening unless we make that effort and we have support for that effort to document and share it. I find this absolutely key, more for the rangelands than for the cropland. On cropland is much more available, on rangeland it is not. And we need it there most. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Hans Peter. Thank you, everyone. Um, now yeah. uh, we have come to the yes. Okay. Somebody is trying to talk. Amina. Yes. Just one last uh, uh, comment to support uh, Hans Peter's uh, comment. Is, uh -huh. uh, the biggest challenge we are having right now is in the assaults is water, is the rain issue. But when we get that little rain, how are we harvesting it? We don't necessarily need to have these big water storage uh, tanks and all that. Recently, I was going around and uh, we were doing a uh, restoration of the riverbank using bamboo. And uh, we got some, some, some rain. And uh, I was really not happy with how we were losing the little that we were getting because we have water pans but we are seeing water that is going elsewhere. If the, the, met, uh, the meteorological department gives the, the weather um, forecast, I believe it's also good to have the community itself having some people coming and redirecting and channeling the water to come and even go into the, the, the water pans. Because I don't know, in, so, in some cases where the water pan is being uh, established, where the water pans are being established are not able to you know harvest enough water so even having this you know small small uh, taros going in there would help in uh, harvesting that small water let's make it like a, a an, an every person's uh, obligation to ensure we harvest and get the little that we the little rains we are getting thank you thank you amina uh, so go, um when I reflect on the last three comments um, um, and the questions that have been asked uh, before, I, I, I just want to concur that then there is a lot of opportunity for all of us to come together, document the practices so that we can be able to learn from each other, see which way to go forward, because then there's a, a lot of opportunity for us to do that. Um, so as we conclude, Thank you everyone for taking your time and being with us up to the end of this webinar. Uh, this has been the last webinar in a series of four webinars um, for different action groups that um, we've, we've organized. And uh, the culmination of all this then is next week in the Kenya National Scaling Conference that is happening on the 24th and the 25th. You are welcome to join. Um, a link for the conference has been posted here, it's virtual. Uh, we'll be happy to see you there and you will hear the work that has been done by the different action groups and the, and the way forward. Uh, what I can also just say as we conclude is that the Rangelands Action Group is going to continue. So for the participants who have not been able to participate in, in, the, in the action group, uh, this is some of the discussions we have in the action groups and more. So you kindly, you can, you can also join us. Uh, as the action group continues, as we look for the way that it will continue to grow, there is a lot, we can see there is a lot of work in the rangelands that needs all of us. Um, but uh, that, that is all that we can talk about today. Thank you so much for your time. Um, so see you at the conference, please register and be there. Um, otherwise, thank you. And uh, we connect again at another time. <clears throat>